My name is Tara Whalen of the Highstead Foundation, and I'm excited to welcome you to this session, Turning Over Rocks, Underutilized Sources of Funding. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us and introduce you to my colleague, Lee Welpton of the Conservation Finance Network. Hi, Lee. And oh, there she is. <laughs> Uh, and before I turn it over to Lee, I want to acknowledge the team that has worked so hard to bring this series together. From Highstead, we have Jody Kologi, Jean Ammermuller, Tawasrit Vaughn, Fiona Lunt, and Jackie Wrigley, who have been helping behind the scenes with communications and tech. And on the Conservation Finance Network team, we have Helen Rogers and Jackson Moeller, who've helped to plan and design the course, as well as bring together all of our speakers for the series. And with that, I'm going to ask Lee to introduce our panel and tell us a bit about what we have planned for today. Thanks, Tara, and welcome, folks. We're really excited to jump in. Uh, turning over rocks, underutilized sources of funding. Uh, hopefully, the title is instigatory enough to get some of you to sign up, and hopefully, we can make good on that promise by actually sharing a couple tips, tricks, and uh, places to look for sources of funding and financing to support your efforts. So um, I'm Lee Welpton, Director of the Conservation Finance Network. Our fundamental business is to expand people's capacity, confidence, and connections to execute on conservation finance. We bridge sectors and we help people find the capital they need to advance the pace and scale of their own efforts. Um, and the power of being a network is really our ability to bring together practitioners beyond their individual mission statements and business models. So our objective is to align energy and innovation on what matters most. You can imagine, um, we're pretty excited today to talk about places where folks can really track and anticipate sources of funding and better jockey to get their projects in the queue. I'll share a quick word of thanks to the Highstead team and of course, everyone joining us. Uh, everyone here today has some frustration or challenge in finding the resources to support their work. We asked you the question on the sign up form just to learn a little bit more about that. Uh, unsurprisingly, many of the frustrations and challenges are just finding the sources and figuring out how to secure them. We hope this particular Learning Lab session, but also the broader series, will really provide some practical insight and guidance to help you try something new, whether that's picking up the phone and calling somebody, whether that's starting to build a relationship, or starting to acquire information and insight that you need to actually secure the capital to advance your project efforts. Um, so plenty to follow up on. That's our hope. We want to give you plenty to follow up on within your organizations, your collaborations, and your community. Gonna jump in with some introductions to today's speakers. Uh, we have Alan Front, CEO of Conservation Pathways and longtime presenter at our boot camp uh, for nearly 40 years, first as senior staff at the Treasure Public Land, then as CEO of Conservation Pathways, Alan has devised and implemented strategies to complete complex land conservation and restoration initiatives. He's helped secure 50 billion in programmatic funding, directing much of that to specific needs across 48 states. Uh, Alan has been my, um, what's, the, what's the stone, the translation stone? He's, he's my seeker whenever we need to understand a little bit more about the current state of affairs with a particularly federal funding. And so we're really thrilled to have him with us today to help share some of that insight on federal funding programs and how you can start to think about them as resources for your work. We also have Allison Sounders. She's a financial analyst with the EPA's Clean Water State Revolving Fund, which if you don't know about it before today, we hope you definitely know about it by the end of today. Um, let's see, Allison has served as a member of the State Revolving Fund branch since 2017. Uh, she's been a member of the team that implements and evaluates the clean state water sorry, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and provides technical assistance to EPA's regional offices. Um, we've invited Allison frequently to talk about the power of the SRF program for particularly uh, land and resource conservation programs. She's a big proponent of this type of use of the SRF and we're thrilled today not to steal any of the wind from her sails, but uh, with a little bit of what's coming down the pipeline for the capitalization of the SRF program. 
Uh, so some, some really important reasons to have you with us today, Allison. Plus it's, it's just delightful to have you. And last but certainly not least, Wade Shelton, Senior Project Manager with the Trust for Public Land. Uh, Wade's been at it for 20 years working in land conservation and environmental restoration. Currently Senior Project Manager with the JEPS Conservation Fellow for TPL's Colorado and Southwest office. Um, he's read a diverse range of conservation projects and initiatives across a variety of landscapes, including um, the buddy show with our own Jackson Moeller at CFN before he joined us on Fisher's Peak in Colorado, which is an incredible story of one of Colorado's newest state parks. All right, so we have our speakers, we have our mission for today, um, turning over rocks. Well, we want to accomplish a couple of things under that banner. You've heard of and possibly, hopefully even used some of the major federal funding programs, things like Farm Bill programs, LWCF, NACA grants, but what else is out there or what sources haven't you yet known about or considered using? Not to mention we are in the midst of a rather historic moment for uh, particularly federal resources, federal funding and financing, and a landslide of allocations coming our way that we really need to be as sophisticated and ready as possible to understand how to garner for conservation. Um, I'll just share a couple quick highlights to help folks understand just the magnitude of this moment. Uh, most of these are coming from the $1.2 trillion infra in, uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or the, I don't know where it's at in the reconciliation process right now, uh, 3.5 trillion reconciliation, Reconciliation Bill, AKA Build Back Better. When it comes to forestry, um, we stand to gain 1.25 billion for the Forest Legacy Program, 100 million for community, okay, Alan's saying even more, 100 million for Community Forest and Open Space Conservation Program, 50 million for the Healthy Forest Reserve Program, 175 million for Recreation Economies for Rural Communities Program, on the agriculture front, $9 billion for EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, $7.5 for RCPP, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And though we may use acronyms today, I'm going to challenge all of our speakers to explain the acronyms lest we devolve into an alphabet soup of federal programs. $4 billion for the Conservation Stewardship Program, CSP, $1.5 for the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, ASAP. On the climate front, $9 billion for Coastal and Great Lakes Restoration and Climate Resilience Projects, $3 billion for the Civilian Climate Corps. And then other than that, uh, a whole lot of other things that frankly, I've had a hard time tracking and following. $11 billion for Abandoned Mine Land Restoration, $4.5 for FEMA buyouts, uh, particular for flooding and disaster prone, 1 billion for the US Fish and Wild Ser Wildlife Service, a culvert removal and replacement program, 800 million for dam removal and repair, and 2.5 billion for Indian water rights settlement. So this is like a vast oversimplification of what's been tucked into these bills and the potential that they have in terms of the magnitude of resources coming our direction. All of this new funding uh, is part of what Alan and Allison are gonna tell us about, the existing federal programs and their current funding allocations with these new infusions to help uh, scurry us along on where we need to be. But where does that position us? Um, you know, Few of us are really ready for the magnitude of this capital. And it's not always certain that the full extent of the capacity of something per se, like the state revolving funds are going to land in conservation. Um, so this session is really about getting ourselves better equipped to know what's out there, to know what's coming, and especially to have just a little bit in the way of tips and tricks to be able to know how to secure those funds. And what I mean by that, groups like the Nature Conservancy, the Conservation Fund, they often have a dedicated staff person whose sole purpose it is to track and support programs to these funding sources, to position them to be among the most competitive proposals going in for that funding source in a given allocation year. Uh, but for most of us, we're just a little too small to afford that kind of dedicated staff personnel. So one of our other aims for today is really to 
help democratize the playbook, if you will, for how you can better track, anticipate, and politic around these funding and financing opportunities so that it's our projects that are at the forefront uh, of the list and of the minds of those who are making decisions about the allocation of those funding sources. So that's my attempt to just tee up a discussion uh, and we'll pass things over to Alan to get us started in the official and a formal uh, content. Thank Alan, you. take it away. I will do that and thank you. I need to ask a bit of technical help. I'm going to hit screen share, right? Yes. And forgive me. There we go. And this. Share. We're all learning together today at this uh, learning lab. Do, do you have my PowerPoint up subject to my hitting that button? Yep, if you want to hit the presenter view, there you go. Well, my work here is done. I don't feel like we need to talk anymore now that I've managed to master that. Um, but I will talk a bit more for approximately 12 minutes according to Lee's instructions. Uh, and really want to thank Lee for your kind words, but also thank all of you for the chance just to kick around the idea of using all of those billions uh, that are suddenly available and tapping into undersubscribed programs that existed before there was a IIJA or BIF as it's known, the infrastructure bill or a Build Back Better on the, uh, uh, on the horizon. I do believe that that Build Back Better uh, uh, is on the horizon. Um, and maybe that's something we can talk about during discussion. But um, I'm going to just offer a bit of an overview, maybe of the kinds of opportunities that are out there, and then turn to my wiser co-panelists, to Allison and to Wade, to dig in a little bit deeper on a couple of these funding sources and the practical way to lay claim to them. But I'll start by uh, uh, offering a quote from noted uh, American folk hero, bank robber, and accidental conservation philosopher, Willie Sutton who did not say, it is a historical inaccuracy, he never said that he robbed banks because that's where the money was. But he did in his book, Where the Money Was, say this, he said, I never felt as alive as I did when I was in a bank. And as Lee suggests, for the rest of us conservation theorists and practitioners, um, I, my perspective is that there's never been a better time to be alive and to feel alive and to, uh, to, to undertake our own conservation bank robberies. Uh, that perspective comes, as Lee suggested, from about four decades, 39 years of conservation work, nailing down and uh, looking to grow conservation funding sources, uh, uh, establishing new programs in different agencies, and uh, laying claim to those dollars for specific projects ranging from in the upper left hand corner of your screen, a uh, project that connected the two disparate parts of Virgin Island National Park on St. John's on the upper right, millions of dollars and thousands of acres of additions at Haleakala National Park in Hawaii and the lower left, the red rocks around Sedona and in Arizona, including the only publicly available campground in the lower right, a greenway of 150 miles north and south of Atlanta um, uh, thousands of acres and millions of dollars worth of recreation lands, tens of thousands and tens of millions in the California Sierra. Um, the headwaters of the Connecticut River representing about 4% of the entire state of New Hampshire. Uh, multiple properties on the birth home block of the Martin Luther King National Historic Site as we approach his birthday. Um, an economic restitution project in the Pacific Northwest with the Quinault Indian Nation that uh, brought uh, much needed money to a tribe uh, by uh, selling a conservation easement on their property that protects some of the largest trees in creation and also critically important habitat for spotted owl, marbled merlet, various runs of salmon. Well, all of this has been possible in candidly less ham and egg days in less uh, opportunity filled 
moments in federal in federal policy. And it's because of what has happened over time in these buildings, um, the programs that have been authorized, that have been funded through the appropriations process, that have gotten dedicated funding, that have been grown over time, uh, all of that has been at work or at play for years. But again, there's never been a time like this moment. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the opportunity of now. Uh, and I'll start by offering, and please don't try to write this down. I, these lists will be available and I'm gonna blast through it without really pausing. But there is a host of conservation opportunity folded into this long laundry list of federal programs. You're looking at the various programs within the Land and Water Conservation Fund and NACA, which I think Lee mentioned, which is available as direct grants to nonprofits, as well as to, to uh, local communities, states, and others. Um, uh, migratory bird money, duck stamp money, state wildlife grants, which if the Rawa bill goes through, will amount to $1.4 billion a year in perpetuity. Um, Dingle Johnson and Pittman Robertson, it's billions of dollars that are showing up in the states that are available. And this is all very sort of garden variety conservation stuff that is least mentioned in her introduction. Many of you probably have deep experience in, maybe less deep experience in some of these. There is a long list here of farm bill programs, including the ASEP, ALE, and Wetland Reserve easements that a lot of you probably have experience in and that Wade might, I bet, talk about during his discussion. I have some uh, wrestling dogs on the floor, so you'll hear noise. It's not my hungry stomach as Pacific time lunch approaches. It's it's a Coco and Kai, who may get a screen appearance later in this discussion. But uh, BIA money, uh, uh, money through the Forest Service's different programs apart from Forest Legacy, which is under LWCF, uh, Department of Commerce and NOAA programs, including the Coastal Estuarine Land Conservation Program, which was moribund for years. It was dormant uh, for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, and is now back because of money that was put into the uh, infrastructure bill. Department of Defense money, which I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. And yes, there's more. It's, it's uh, FEMA money under Department of Homeland, uh, not just for the old hazard mitigation program, but for the relatively recent BRIC program, which does have a focus uh, on uh, natural solutions, nature-based solutions. Army Corps, uh, energy mitigation, the state revolving funds, not just uh, the, the uh, clean water, SRF that, that Allison does so much to help manage, but the Safe Drinking Water SRF, huge capitalization available for conservation. Uh, settlements to Department of Justice, various transportation programs, all of which have been on the rise. The Tiger Grants are now approaching a, a billion dollars a year, but that uh, pales in comparison with what's coming in transportation, which I'll talk about in a minute. New market tax credits, CDBG money, it's a very long list. And as you look at it, and I hope that I satisfied Lee your, your exhortation not to just use acronyms. But as you look at these different programs, whether you know them by letters or by words, it, it, is, uh, it can be quite consuming to try to get a handle on how you go from this list of maybe 50 or so programs and the 50 or 100 other programs that are available potentially for conservation. How do you how do you translate that into real world need and on the ground on the on the ground project work? Well, I have two suggestions. One of them is there are a couple of federal websites uh, which I think might be getting dropped into the into the into the chat as we talk. One of them is the electronic successor to the old catalog of federal domestic assistance, which I was reared on when I first came to TPL in 1984. Uh, it's called SAM.gov, and if you go to www.sam.gov, you can search all federal programs. You can put in keywords and find interesting stuff. There's also a website that's run by Department of Health and Human Services called Grants.gov. It's www.grants.gov. Easy to remember. That only is, uh, a, it is a very easily searched listing of programs for which the federal agencies have issued notices of funding availability or notices of funding opportunity. So if there's a NOFO or a NOFA, far, sorry for the alphabets, 
But if there are, if those are out there, if they've actually posted in the federal register that there's money available, then it shows up on grants.gov. That's one way of doing it. The cold analytical keyboard click. It is also not necessarily the most efficient or the best way of getting at this stuff. And Lee mentions that there are organizations and people like me who've spent a lot more time digging into these funding sources. And what I would suggest is that um, it is better to have a tour guide than it is to stand on an, an, un, on an unknown street corner trying to unfold a map. And it, you should definitely think about getting in touch with people who have more experience in the kinds of conservation that you're looking at. And as the examples that I'm about to show suggest, um, the hook isn't necessarily the hook that you think it's going to be as you get into these uh, into this quest for funding. Uh, with that, I, I want, and again, this is other folks' suggestions, so if you don't like it, then don't blame me. But um, I've been asked to share with you what kind of unseen or uh, undersubscribed opportunity there is in those garden variety programs that you work with all the time. What there is in more customary conservation programs that you may be less familiar with and what there is that is truly unknown to us all uh, that that we can make our own future together with if we are smart enough or diligent enough and so i am not going to try to go through all those many programs lwcf isn't the only usual suspect there are the farm bill programs and the coastal estuarine land conservation program I'm not going to talk about those now, but we can, excuse me, we can talk about them later. Guys, please, I'm talking. Um, uh, I'll talk about REPI, and Allison is going to share with you, I think, a good deal of detail on the uh, SRFs, which are being increasingly used for conservation at the same time that they are receiving robust new capitalization. Um, so those will be at least um, markers, exemplars of what's possible. And then I'm going to talk about a Department of Transportation program that was just established in the BIF, in the IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, that has tremendous potential, but only if we take advantage of it. Starting with LWCF, I'm not going to stem wind about this because everybody knows what it is. It buys federal land. It provides grants to states and localities to do land acquisition, in some cases, recreation facilities development. It was, of course, the subject after 36 years of my efforts, making me the least effective, efficient lobbyist in Washington. Um, it was uh, last year fully funded, dedicated funding in perpetuity at $900 million. I will share with you that that does not in itself create new opportunity just because $900 million doesn't go far enough. It just doesn't meet the need. So you're looking here at the Everglades in the upper left, Grand Teton in the upper right. These are places that I've had the pleasure of working along with the, in the lower left, the uh, Conti National Wildlife Refuge and four New England states. Those are all federal acquisition areas. Is there great new opportunity in federal acquisition? Well, the federal agencies have maybe 40% more money than they used to have when LWCF was funded at half its current amount. That's more but it's not a princely sum. And I can share with you the Fish and Wildlife Service as an example. Uh, this last round, the Fish and Wildlife Service said, great news, we have dedicated funding. What do we need to acquire? They collected a list of 250 some odd million dollars of acquisition need in fiscal 22. They will receive about half of that. And so the competition is maybe slightly less fierce than it's been before for federal acquisition dollars. Same for Forest Legacy. In the lower right, you're looking at an $8 million Forest Legacy project in, in, uh, uh, that was recently done in the state of Idaho, most important uh, pothole wetlands in the state. And uh, the Forest Legacy program is similarly oversubscribed. As Lee mentioned, that could change with the passage of the Build Back Better Act, which now includes not 1.25, but $1.45 billion for, as a Alan. Forest Legacy. Legacy plus up. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but we're just coming up, up to time here. Okay. I will be very brief. 
uh, but I'll rip through the next two examples as well. But what I'm gonna tell you is on LWCF, there are undersubscribed pieces of LWCF. One of them is the Outdoor, Re Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership, which is urban parks money. Another is the Cooperative Endangered Species Fund, which is not fully spent out and has a back, actually has unobligated balances. TPL, my colleagues are using this right now, uh, adding $11 million to a uh, to top off a $97 million campaign to buy the uh, largest remaining piece of coastal uh, open space on the Southern California shoreline on the Pacific coast. Uh, it is important because of the character of these communities. That's the reason that people are so are pulling together $100 million. That's the reason a private donor came up with 50 million of the 100 million. But the reason the Fish and Wildlife Service is involved is because of this bird the California net catcher and the least bells vireo and four other threatened or endangered federal listed species. And so you may be doing a project because it's important for open space reasons, but if you have a hook on something else, then you may be able to get access to undersubscribed funding. In that middle ground of programs that are, are uh, uh, not fully subscribed all the time, but people are getting more and more familiarity with is the REPI program, the Readiness and Environmental Protection Initiative of the Department of Defense. When somebody wanted to build 398 homes at the end of the runway of the New Orleans uh, Joint Reserve Base Naval Air Station, when people want to build houses on the fringe of and encroach on the operations of Camp Pendleton in California, when some of the most beautiful open, coastal open space in the world on the north shore of Hawaii is under threat and is also adjacent to the, the uh, army garrison on, on, on the island of, of uh, Oahu. There's defense money that's available. Uh, that money used to be 50 or 60 million a year, then it was 75, then it was 100. This year, it'll be 150. So again, it's funding that's on the rise. Then last but not least, I want to talk about transportation. And again, Lee, I will wrap up here, but uh, you're looking at two Highway 1s, Ca uh, California Highway 1 on the right at Big Sur, which obviously is less drivable when there's a big hole in it and the lanes are gone. Three, four million people a year drive this highway. It's a tremendous economic driver and it's one of the most beautiful coastal open space on the planet. Uh, to the left of that is Louisiana Highway 1, which is America's energy highway. Energy production pretty much grinds to a halt. If this highway is inundated, it is at or below sea level and sea level is rising and Louisiana coast is where it is that, that rising sea level is having some of the greatest effects. Down below that, you're looking at two I-70s or two, two Route 70s. You're looking at I-70 in Denver, which was closed for a good long time because of washouts from wildfire. And on the right-hand side, you're looking at California State Route 70, which has also been wild, has wildfire related landslides. Um, transportation resiliency has been a huge issue. Resilience in general is a huge issue. There in the, in the funding that Lee talked about, resilience and climate resilience is a driver for a lot of the money that's in the IIJA and Build Back Better bills. But it also has produced in the IIJA, plunked down money in the bank, $8.7 billion for a brand new grant program called the Protect Grant Program. Protect grants are available for transportation resilience, which can mean elevating highways or retrofitting highways against storm damage and wind, wind and, and tidal surge, or it can mean um, nature-based solutions. And that's built into the program, uh, but it's untested. So I would say for this kind of program where there is new opportunity, for those undersubscribed programs or those areas where there is un, uh, untapped money instead of unmet need, where there is uh, plenty instead of over competition, shame on us if we don't fully capitalize them and lay claim to that money. Shame on us if the Protect Grant Program doesn't spend a billion dollars of the 8.7 on nature-based solutions that you all are working on. And so with that, I will wrap and pass the talking stone along to, I think, to Allison or Lee, back to you. Um, yep, looking yep. forward to talking about this some more. Alan, thank you. And we'll get into this more in the panel discussion in Q&A. <clears throat> but what, what we really hope folks are going to take forward is just a little bit of um, initiative or perhaps 
motivation to re-inventory some of the, whether it's federal or even state and local funding sources that perhaps we've considered in the past or not yet considered, but not yet applied for or secured. There's just a tremendous opportunity both now and coming down the pipeline. Um, so we'll, we'll get in a little bit of how you anticipate when those uh, programs actually have RFPs and allocations available to you. But just to, to do a more full scan, we put it in the title of the session, Turning Over Rocks, to better understand the full suite of, of um, funding programs that may be able to support your project efforts. All right, we've got Allison queued up next. I think uh, we'll get her on the screen here. Perfect. Thanks, Lee. <laughs> Happy to be back talking with folks. Um, so my name's Allison and I work for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund at the EPA headquarters in DC. Next slide. Um, actually, this is just the contents. I'll give a little background um, and then some exciting updates on the Biden infrastructure law and then some examples of how um, SRF funds have been used to finance conservation projects. So the next slide um, just gives a quick overview of the program. The Clean Water State Revolving Fund is basically an environmental bank that provides low cost financing to water quality projects. Um, the EPA provides seed money every year called a capitalization grant to the states who provide a match. And that money goes out in the form of low interest loans to eligible assistance recipients. The principal repayments and interest are recycled back into the fund to finance new projects. Um, it's important to note that the states are, the SRFs are state implemented and operated. It gives them a wide range of flexibility to target their priorities, um, but it also means that there's 50 different programs operating. So it's important to remember that in your state, it might not be called the state revolving fund. Um, it might be housed in a different program, but it's still the money that's coming in with the same eligibilities. Next slide. The next slide um, just kind of shows land conservation. Since the um, fund began in 1987, cumulative financing for the land for land conservation um, projects has been over 126 million. Um, this does not. This map actually doesn't include silviculture, and I know some states have. There's at least 100 million for silviculture that would be showing up on this map. But the point is that. Um, these projects have been eligible, land conservation projects have been eligible um, under our non-point source eligibility since 1987, but only 126 million, let's say like 200 maybe, has gone to funding um, these projects compared to the total that CWS have funded since 1987, and that's $145.5 billion. So, the next slide just goes over um, lots of text, but the basic point is that there's a lot of financial benefits that come with the flexibilities of the um, Clean Water State Revolving Fund programs. The states can set specific loan terms, including interest rates from 0% to market rate. Um, they can set repayment periods up to 30 years or more in some states. Um, they work with partners and borrowers on deferred payments, the structures of your loans, um, many projects, we see partners coming together to co-fund um, a project if they can't get everything from one source. And our financing is able to match grants that support eligible projects. So um, we've seen folks use SRF money, for instance, to match a USDA grant. U I think it was RD in Florida. So that's um, helpful for a lot of folks, the grant match. So next slide. So the CWSRF is still a loan program at its core. So when applying to the SRF, you, borrowers need to come in with an identified dedicated repayment source that they're gonna use to repay the loan, but that doesn't need to come from the project itself. So it's often difficult to find a repayment source for like a land conservation restoration project, but a lot of borrowers we've seen have demonstrated a lot of creativity. Um, we've seen folks use homeowner fees, um, stormwater district fees, timber harvest revenues, 
Um, this photo is actually from a project in California where the Yurok tribe received a zero interest loan to purchase over 22,000 acres along the lower Klamath River. Um, it was really interesting and neat because the tribe used carbon offset revenues to repay the loan until the timber was old enough to be harvested and to start serving as a repayment stream. Um, next slide. Um, so additional subsidization, that's what we call it, but this money is basically a portion of free money that can be sent out within each state every year in the form of principal forgiveness, negative interest loans, or grants. Um, since 2009, we've pr provided about $5.5 in this subsidy. And it's a great resource for communities and borrowers that would have difficulty paying um, financing projects otherwise without grant-like money that doesn't need to be repaid um, because it can reduce, it can at least reduce or eliminate the amount that must ultimately be repaid. Um, this subsidy, it's meant to be targeted toward communities with environmental justice issues um, that would have difficulty facing projects without this help, as well as stormwater, energy and water efficiency, and sustainable project planning, design, and construction. So um, these type of projects have received additional subsidization in states. So the next slide, um, just quickly, who is eligible? Um, municipalities are the main borrower that we see communities coming in, but um, we also loan to private entities, nonprofit organizations, citizen groups, um, individual farmers in some states. But the caveat is that these are each state run programs. So certain states might have a restriction in their statute that says you can't you can't finance a land conservation project to a private entity um so that is something to remember the next slide sorry i'm trying to get through so i don't take too much time so this is just um the eligibilities that are set forth in the clean water act for the state revolving fund the top three um have been in since the start of the program but many of the newer um, eligibility is at the bottom, would cover non-point source restoration type projects. Um, we can finance watershed planning, which is something a lot of folks don't know about, um, watershed pilot projects. Um, and let me, the next slide has kind of the land conservation specific, if you would switch. So um, for land conservation, it's CWSRF can provide for pro financing for projects that result in the protection or restoration of surface water. So that includes leasing, the simple purchase of land or easements. Um, a really great resource is our overview of eligibilities. It's, oh, oh, it doesn't show on the slide. Um, well, the websites are on the slide and I can send them out later or you can email me. Um, we have an overview of the eligibilities. That's just kind of everything listed out. But then we also have specific fact sheets that cover different topics, and one of them is for land conservation. So the types of projects that are eligible, other like land, fee simple purchase and easements, but you can also do source water protection, planning and assessment, like I mentioned, habitat restoration, um, and more. And again, it will depend, probably depend on the state. So I mentioned that the SRFs require a dedicated revenue stream for repaying um, to be identified when you come in for a loan, and it can be difficult for borrowers that don't have a repayment stream. Um, we usually see treatment plants and municipalities using their user fees for repayment. Um, and the other, there's also other challenges um, in just in terms of the capacity at the state. Sometimes these projects aren't as large, and it takes a lot more capacity to work on. Um, sometimes there's other restrictions, like I mentioned, at the state level that they may face statutorily or administratively. Um, for instance, some states can't lend to NGOs and some can't go below a 1% interest rate. So to be able to address these challenges, next slide, please. If a state is looking to fund an eligible type of project, they usually are have just come up with great creative pro programs to be able to reach non-point source conservation type, what we call non-traditional projects. Um, 
With the ad sub, there's a maximum amount of free money available each year. So states have come up with financing mechanisms to alleviate the repayment burden on non-point source projects and reach borrowers otherwise unable to access the funds. Um, there's a plethora of different ones and not every state uses each one. So I included a link, that link does show up, a link to our guide at the bottom here. And you can um, search through the guide using these keywords. Next slide. So the financing mechanism that states have been using um, to mostly finance conservation and land type projects is called sponsorship. Um, sponsorship takes a wastewater utility or a municipality that is able to, that is coming in for a larger type project. And the SRF makes an agreement, we will decrease your interest rate on this $50 million loan, or I guess in this case, a million dollar loan, will decrease your interest rate if you sponsor a conservation restoration type project. So in Ohio, it's specifically for um, land conservation and easements. Other states um, have used the money for restoration of land and other type projects, but it ends up being the same. What's great is it ends up being the same repayment amount for the sponsoring entity, but the sponsored project, the land conservation is, is no repayment because it's bundled in with or sponsored by the um, point source project. Next slide. So we have been super busy at EPA um, because on top of our usual um, appropriations this year, the bipart wait, bipartisan Biden? I can't remember. The bill, the infrastructure law was just passed and it increases um, federal funding for wastewater infrastructure for the next five years um, through the Clean Water SRF by $11 billion over five years. And that's added on to the base money that each states get. And that adds up to like 2 billion maybe. So there's about 2 more billion every year available for clean water SRF eligible projects, which include land conservation. And the eligibilities um, for the bill money are reflective of our base program. Um, there is an emerging, emerging contaminant supplemental of $1 billion, that says $1 million. It's $1 billion. Um, they're still kind of working on the list of emerging contaminants. So I would say wait for more information on that um, or email me if you have more questions. But I included a fact sheet um, on the bill on the slide, but it's also on, a, um, I can also provide it to you or I have a list of links. So. The next slide is just the, 49 or additional subsidization um, generally is 10 to 40 percent. That's the free money that is given out from principal forgiveness and grants out of the federal appropriation every year out of the capitalization grant. So the new 11.3 billion that's added on each year, they have to give 49 percent of that away as free money, loan forgiveness, um, negative interest loans and grants. So that's a lot more that can be used to either reduce the burden of payment for someone or alleviate it entirely in some cases. Um, and again, that's targeted by states to disadvantaged communities and innovative projects. Um, the next and slide. Allison, we just have a minute or two more here. Okay, cool. So this project, I'll just really quick, there's a lot of talk on here, but or a lot of typing on here, but this is a um, project that just went through in Delaware. They have a sponsorship program that's called the Land Conservation Land Program within their SRF that's called the Water Pollution Control Fund. So you kind of have to go into the websites at the link I'll provide and work your way through them to find information on the state programs. Um, this, In this case, the city of Rehoboth, their um, wastewater treatment plant came in for $43 million worth of loans. So they agreed, they wanted a lower interest rate. So the SRF agreed to lower the interest rate from 3.15 to 2.87. And that created $5 million for the acquisition and restoration of 190 acres 
um, and 60 um, acres that are to be reforested. Um, the sponsor is responsible for loan payment and um, the sponsored project um, is the Sussex County Council is working with their local estuary and they work with their conservation district to partner. Um, so sponsorship does involve a lot of partnering and getting everything set up. But once you come in, um, the programs will work with you. So next slide. So this, I'll just basically say the EPA's drinking water state revolving program, like Alan mentioned, can also finance um, source water protection. So it's out of two of their set asides. I don't think um, these details probably aren't necessary here, but there have been um, some folks that have been able, unable to get assistance from the Clean Water SRF who have come into the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund for Source Water Protection Funds. Um, they also have loans and um, principal forgiveness available. The next slide is just an example where um, in Washington, the Skagit Public Utility District wanted to um, buy up some land and put it into easement. So they came in for a grant from the DWSRF to appraise the land, and then they used that information to purchase the property with CWSRF money. And I think that's, that's it. There we go. Um, the next slide just has my contact information. Feel free to email me. Um, there's a newsletter we have. Yeah, and this last link I can provide to everyone. That is the list of state program websites that you will go to for your specific state. But you can email me and I will connect you with someone um, that's appropriate. Yeah, thank you. Allison, so thank you so much. Um, if folks take nothing else away from your content, I think it's really a kind of an important moment to get that call in to your state SRF office to build that relationship. Um, hopefully you live in a state that does have a sponsorship program, um, but even if you don't, it, it can't hurt to build a relationship within that office. Um, maybe to have that conversation about enabling a sponsorship program, mm -hmm. especially given the amount of funding. And uh, Allison, I'm so glad you highlighted that 49% of the new funds, which needs to be uh, contributed to the further subsidization uh, mm -hmm. or kind of relief from some of those loan terms. Um, so hopefully people picked up on some of the intelligence of why we have Allison here today. Uh, there may actually be some, some free money um, I know there's no such thing as a free lunch, but um, a heavily subsidized lunch by the utility that buys you a free lunch is certainly worth the conversation or exploration. Yeah. All right, we'll get into a little bit more of this again in the panel and Q&A, but we want to pass things over in quick order here to Wade. Um, Wade's got a lot of different projects I imagine he's, he's going to talk to us about, but um, also just in the vein of kind of democratizing or, or cracking open the recipe of the secret sauce of what uh, some of these organizations do to be able to get their project higher ranked within a competitive grant program. Wade, take it away. Thank you, Lee. No, and uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to present to you all today. I'm still um, processing that somehow I am on a panel with Alan Front. Um, Alan, take the compliment. He was a legend before I got hired by TPL 15 years ago. So. Uh, you know, I'll do my best to keep up, but uh, I'm going to do something a little different than the other two panelists. And then, uh, and, and based on what our marketing department tells us, there's a running joke at the Trust for Public Land that when you talk about our work, you want to talk about why, not how. Today, I'm going to talk about why and how, because you're all deal junkies like me, and you want to know how you could utilize these funding sources. How do groups like the Trust for Public Land, the Nature Conservancy, the conservation fund who have dedicated, I mean, we have a whole team in DC that is all federal affairs, all federal funding, any federal funding I'm looking at, I have folks I can call in DC to learn more. You know, so we do have more resources, but that being said, nobody does anything by themselves uh, in life and certainly not in conservation. So we are all only as good as our partners. So, you know, I'd say uh, partnerships are the name of the game for all of this. So the first example I'm going to talk to you guys about is the Sherview Property Acquisition 
uh, that's in Weld County. It's a community separator in between the city of Greeley and the town of Windsor. And it's a thousand acre natural area on the Poudre River. Uh, let me get the next slide, please. Or it should be going next slide. I don't know why. I'm having technical difficulties here, guys. Hold on a second. Uh, why that's not showing. Okay, there we go. Thanks for your patience. So first question, you know, with any kind of larger project, this is a thousand acre natural area with eight and a half million dollar purchase price. Well, it's not easy to put together eight and a half million and certainly not in a time frame that a private landowner who's certainly in this real estate market is used to a developer who might close in 90 days. Uh, how did we put together eight and a half million on this active project that should close at the end of March? And how did we make it so compelling you know, for funding partners and so on? Well, the first key with any of this stuff is the project's gotta be right. You know, the, the window of opportunity really needs to be now. So, and that's what we're, you know, you, and if you don't get it done within the time frame, you know, you're, it, it, the opportunity is going to go away. And that's exactly what we're dealing with in Shoreview. This was a project I started working on two and a half years ago. The city, city of Greeley and town of Windsor have been chasing this white whale for 10 years and couldn't get anywhere. And by virtue of finally putting a viable deal together, we've got our opportunity. But if we don't close by the end of March, you know, the, the landowner is going to put it on the open market. And when you look at the Colorado real estate market, a thousand acres on the Poudre River outside of Greeley, that'll go fast. So you need urgency. Number two, uh, name of the game these days, especially with these you know, larger, newer federal uh, and some of the newer federal sources is community buy-in. You, you need to be able to demonstrate that the project you are putting together is really addressing and meeting the community's needs. Uh, you need it to be a bottom up approach. And it's, I can tell you is working for one of the, you know, the larger conservation groups, we're very cognizant of that if we come in and ultimately are telling local you know, gra partners, grassroots organizations, what they should be doing rather than implementing their own vision, because that's really our job, we're not gonna get anywhere either. So in this case with Shoreview, it's, it is the highest priority project in the Get Outdoors really a strategic plan that was finished last year. And it really is the linchpin that if we can get this acquisition done and get it open to the public, it should kick the door open in terms of conservation, restoration, and park and open space opportunities in Greeley and Windsor. So it, it's a logical project to bring forth of, hey, here's, here's something big. We can put this funding together. It's going to catalyze into so much, so many more opportunities. Third, we were, we've been able to secure up to this point a significant amount of money, amount of funding from GOCO, which is the Great Outdoors Colorado Trust Fund. It's funded by the Colorado Lottery uh, and the city of Greeley. We've got about six and a quarter million from those uh, two partners, uh, which is not all the way there at eight and a half, but it's a good place to be. Fourth, the town of Windsor, while they don't have a lot of money, is currently working on the amount of funding they could bring into the project. Uh, should have that settled the next month or so. Uh, and then we know they're going to be able to bring in something because this, this project is the best new regional outdoor recreation opportunity for over a 30 mile radius. Greeley and Windsor residents drive 30 miles on average to go to Larimer County City, go to cities like Fort Collins or Loveland to get outside because they have no opportunities at home. So this is going to be a game changer in terms of economic development, quality of life, and bringing Greeley into the recreation based economy that Colorado largely relies on. And then the, the final reason is development pressure is looming. As I indicated earlier, this is the hottest real estate market Colorado has ever seen. And if we can't close, it, it's going to get subdivided. It'll become a sea of houses and the opportunity is gone. And those are the, some of the critical pieces you need to really be able to compete for funding sources like stateside LWCF, out, uh, ORLP or Outdoor Recreation Legacy uh, Program funding that Alan mentioned among a lot of other resources that you could tap out there. This is kind of the secret sauce that you need to have a big expensive project that should compete well for, for the, the funding opportunities we've been talking about. So one of the things we did on Shoreview that specifically has really helped this one move forward is we took the Get Outdoors Greeley strategic plan and all the existing you know, community, 
based, you know, driven plans at the local up to the state level and use that with our GIS team to come up with a conceptual trail system for the property that has about 18 miles of, of trails, uh, ranging from paved trail to unpaved single track to downhill hiking trails. All this really is, is to demonstrate what could be there. Uh, we didn't need to, you don't need to hire a big landscape architecture firm. This is something that we did on house uh, with our own GIS team and a consultant, but this could be done by a passionate individual with enough time, curiosity, and GIS skills to show what could be there. And what this does is generates more excitement at donors, funders, so that you can get you more comfortable with the risk you might be taking because you can really show what could be there. And it helps demonstrate that community buy-in that the project needs to have without actually having to go do a public engagement process that doesn't make sense when you're working on real estate acquisitions. After you've bought it, that's another thing. But at this point, you don't wanna be doing that yet. So, you know, so knowing that you, how do you do this? How do you actually raise all this money? How did we get to six and a quarter million dollars? And now we have a path forward as well of where we know we can raise the rest of the money we're going to, that we need. So TPL could buy and hold the property at the end of March, and then eventually get this into public ownership with the Greeley and Windsor. Well, you do it with partners. Uh, one of the main takeaways I want you guys to have today is nobody does this alone. The Nature Conservancy doesn't do it alone. The Trust for Public Land doesn't do it alone. The Conservation Fund doesn't do it alone. We all work with uh, government partners at the state, local, federal level, nonprofit partners at the local and, and state level. And because we, if we don't have that grassroots credibility, we can't get this stuff done any better than anyone else. So that's how we approach this. You know, we have a partnership between TPL, Greeley and Windsor, where we're playing to our strengths with TPL focused on private fundraising and funding sources like GoCo that I've lost track of how many grant applications I've written to them over 15 years, where we're set up to go secure that funding and work fun, funding and work effectively with them. Greeley and Windsor, we needed them focused on stateside LWCF funding that could come in after we've bought, and bought the property and help pay off some financing or local funding that demonstrates community buy-in even further and just it gives us more options overall to, to leverage these other grants. And then on the federal funding, knowing that we have to have everybody working on it. Our local partners are absolutely critical because most of that federal funding needs to go to them. It could not go to a nonprofit organization like TPL. Uh, but also knowing that they need our help in our federal affairs team to be able to do the work in D.C. that they can't do. So you need to focus on each partner's strengths, as well as the grant statutory requirements to make sure that your lead on a particular grant you know, is actually you know, eligible to receive it. You also need to approach the project from multiple perspectives and get support from unique supporters. It's very easy for any of us to look at our work through the conservation blinders and really think about you know, the, to be crass, the rare birds, bugs, and bunnies, and not public health, economic development, quality of life, the, the, the kinds of things that if you wanna to put together big pots of money, if you wanna tap, especially federal sources, you need to demonstrate how your project is going to hit on more than one significant goal, and ideally ones they're not expecting from a conservation standpoint. And then the final piece is you want to plan ahead for new opportunities. Uh, as, as we've covered, it take, it's a lot of these funding sources, they can take a while uh, to cultivate and secure. Uh, these projects take a long time to you know, put together. As I mentioned earlier, it's been two and a half years getting Sureview to this point. So you need to be, with that amount of time, you need to plan for other funding that might not be working, available now, but could be down the road. Maybe it's something that you could use to pay off that revolving loan from the EPA so you could qualify for it and then pay it off in a couple of years. So in our case, one thing we're looking at is 2020 census data. We know that based on the 2010 census, Sureview does not fall in an urban area. But when the 2020 census data comes through, it will. So right now, we don't qualify for ORLP funding, but we will a year from now. And that's something we could use to tap for design and construction so that and, and clean up so we can have the confidence and because I'll be I'll be blunt I'm going to talk about I, I want to I'm interested in the EPA revolving loan for this project so that could be a way to pay for it similarly our municipal partners are working with our conservation finance program on potential future local ballot measures that would create dedicated funding 
for conservation, parks and open space in Greeley and Windsor. Those are all potential matches for your federal grants and also ways to pay off revolving loans and financing. So we've done the planning ahead. So we're confident that we have multiple options down the road to raise the remaining money we need uh, to deliver on this project beyond just the real estate deal. You need to be able to demonstrate that uh, or they're not gonna fund the real estate deal because you need to show you can get them all the way there. So the next example I will use is one that is near and dear to my heart and Jackson's, Fisher's Peak State Park, because this was the uh, white whale that Jackson uh, Moeller, uh, Matt Moorhead from the Nature Conservancy and I uh, chased for about, oh, five, six years before it became a new, new state park. Uh, and this was a partnership between GOCO, the Trust for Public Land, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the Nature Conservancy, City of Trinidad, uh, and Los Animas County. So we had partners all across the board on this one. And one thing you might be wondering, well, how do you find these big projects? Where do you find a 19,000 acre acquisition that includes uh, a peak at the gateway to Colorado between uh, New Mexico? Well, like most things, you read about it in the New York Times. Uh, you don't have to just do the crossword puzzle. And uh, it really, it was over seven years ago that I first read about the crazy French ranch and drove down to take a look at it with the broker and tour it. And it's exciting property, but at the time, there was no path forward to getting it done. I uh, talked to my counterpart, Matt, Nature Conservancy. We both wanted to chase it together. We agreed this was too big for either organization to do by ourselves. And given the opportunity to strike a balance between public recreation and conservation from the beginning, made sense as sister organizations to, to work together on it. But folks weren't ready, you know, even despite the opportunity for public recreation, nature preservation economic development. This project could be a way for uh, Trinidad and, and uh, southeastern Colorado to be on the map and be a destination for uh, getting outside rather than for New Mexicans and Texans to you know, buy marijuana. But uh, and it's an opportunity to address equity and public health in a rural community that could look at mountains but couldn't, couldn't get on them. Uh, but it wasn't ready. It took us years of talking to partners, talking to funders, having regular conversations with stakeholders, you know, from all at the, the local level at Trinidad up to the state level around, we've got this huge opportunity, but it, it's really challenging to figure out how to raise the money and who could ultimately own and manage it. Uh, and finally, it did come together in 2018 of where there was a path to do it. Uh, and we were able to buy and hold the property in 2019. We were able to secure enough money out of GOCO and CPW that we could finance 20 million of the purchase and, and take a risk on it. But we knew that it was going to take time to, to pay that off. So we engaged in a master planning process to make sure we were setting ourselves up and our partners for success right away so that the park could open as soon as possible. And we had plans to utilize the U.S. Forest Service Forest Legacy Program uh, to pay off the bridge financing. We, we spent the first year and a half while we're also trying to cook the deal and buy and hold the property of cultivating the forest legacy program. So we knew it could be a viable partner. And then in the first nine months of owning the property, that was our plan. We're gonna take three years of raising forest legacy money each year to, to pay off this loan. But while we were doing this, we were continuing to have the regular conversations you need to have with partners and stakeholders at public agencies, other conservation groups, other stakeholders. So they knew what we were up to. And just by virtue of staying in that regular contact, cultivating those you know, partnerships with potential funders and, and, and other, other partners on the project, uh, the door got kicked open. Governor Polis uh, caught wind that we were gonna take three years to pay off this loan and, and get into public ownership. He wanted to see a new state park right away. So, by continuing to have these conversations, governor caught wind and we were able to reach an agreement where we were able to sell the property to the state at a discount and pay off our financing by April 20, April 2020. Uh, yeah, at the height of the pandemic, we were able to get this into public ownership. And it was only through cultivating these relationships all from the local up to the state level that we were able, that that opportunity came together. Uh, none of this would have been possible without Trinidad's persistence and community passion because ultimately it was clear to everyone that TPL and TNC were there to implement Trinidad's vision and not our own. It was about getting the locals what they needed. And by doing that, that would accomplish our mission. 
And that resulted in the additional state funding and no need for Farce Legacy. So now Fisher's Peak is Colorado's 42nd state park. It's slated to open this summer. Uh, we've had a soft opening where you can do a little hike on some trails, but the, the real opening is coming this summer. But we're not done. You know, it, it's pretty typical in land conservation, especially on the private side. And you get the deal done and, you're, and you go. You know, it, it's up to your public partner to actually implement. And what we've learned on Fisher's Peak that if you really want to be able to put together these big projects and secure these pots of money, you need to give your public partners or, or the project itself the tools it needs for long-term success. And that means that you may need to stick around for more on the planning side after the real estate done is, the deal is done. And that's what we've been doing. We've stuck around for the master planning process, raising a bunch of money for that to kick that off right away so the park could open far more quickly than it would have if we left it up to CPW. Uh, we also worked with Trinidad and Los Animas County to secure a Colorado Department of Local Affairs uh, grant for a recreation plan for southeastern Colorado so that they can have put together the playbook they need in terms of infrastructure investment, in terms of businesses, people, and so on, to take advantage of having a new state park right in their backyard so that they can maximize the economic benefits to their community while benefiting the people who live there, not just pushing them out for new residents. There also Brian, be a long. I'm so sorry to interrupt you here. Um, we're mm -hmm. past time, so I'll I'll just. I'm ask almost you to finished. Wrap up. I'm almost finished. So, we'll also be doing a long-term economic study, so we have some real data to demonstrate uh, the impact of this project and and what worked and what didn't, as well as some public health research. And combined, this creates a replicable model for other rural communities, which should result in new work for TPL and TNC because this all of this work will set up our public partners for more state and federal funding to make these opportunities happen. And they'll need help to do it. So that's the name of the game is that while you're putting these projects together, do it in a way that not only makes the case for what you're doing now, but what you could be doing in the future. So the more you can catalyze more work through this, the more attractive you're gonna be to these funders. So to conclude, partnerships are critical no matter who you are, whom you work for. Uh, for Trust for Public Land, we don't hold land. We don't hold conservation easements long-term. We're only as good as our partners. So any big project I'm putting together, I have partners in local government, state government. I have other land trusts we're working with because there's a role for everyone. I think, honestly, the best way for us collectively to work on this is you put together the biggest coalition you can have so you're playing to everyone's strengths and put together big pots of money so we can all collectively do as much work as we can. So we're not competing. You know, one by one, we're working together to try and make sure that if you're in Ohio, you've got as many options as possible to do what Ohio needs. Two, community engagement. You absolutely need to be able to demonstrate community buy-in and their cr and critical need for what you're doing. Otherwise, you're not going to get anywhere. Third, creativity. You've got to think beyond conservation in terms of goals of impact. Uh, you know, one issue projects aren't going to cut it. Fourth, Patience, it takes years to put these projects together and to complete the planning needed to make the case for funding. So you need to be able to do it for the long haul and not go into it thinking you might put something together in you know, a year. And the final most critical piece is building and maintaining relationships. Nobody can track all these funding sources on their own. Nobody can do all of this on their own. And I think I'm confident everyone on this call knows you can't be effective in this, this field if you're always the tip of the spear. Sometimes you lead from behind and, and being able to get something done means you need a partner to be up front and not you. And that's how these projects work. And that's how these bigger projects coming together. It's a team effort. Thank you. Thanks, Wade. Um, knocked it out of the park and gave just so much intelligence about uh, that secret sauce recipe that we've been talking about. Um, so as we get Allison and Alan uh, queued up here along with Wade and me, I'll, I'll start with a softball question and maybe I'll, I'll start it with you, Allison. Just to recap, if there's one thing you wish people knew about SRFs for land conservation, how might you summarize it? I would say that land conservation is legal in the CWSRF assistance in every state to check if yours is talk call or either email me 
or I'm putting a link to each state website in the chat right now, because if you're looking for funding and you haven't ever talked to an SRF, you need to, because we're especially pushing it um, for more, like I said, non-traditional, like non-point source um, sources of the fund, because contaminants and pollution have really switched to those kinds of, um, those are what's affecting our waterways now. So call your SRF. <laughs> I think that's so key. Um, and Alan, I'll, I'll pivot to you here. I think, you know, your, your presentation touched on a million and one places that people could and should be looking. But I mean, the headlines are coming in faster than we can digest them about the money for conservation, some of which is earmarked through traditional funding programs and some of which is a bit speculative. Um, what advice or counsel do you have for the boots on the ground folks to make sure that as much of that money uh, lands as possible into community land conservation and health servicing projects and programs? So I'm gonna answer that question after I follow up on Allison's discussion of SRFs just to say, you know, there, there was a lot packed into that discussion as well, and it ab absolutely makes sense to be in touch with, with the SRF and to understand what they spend money on. I, I want to highlight, just because of my own experience, the importance, especially as the capitalization increases of the, those sponsorship programs. I've had experience in, in, in Ohio, which has a really well-developed sponsorship program, but there are, I don't know, a dozen, 15 states that do it. And the, just to put a fine point on it, what you're telling folks who are borrowing money from an SRF, it's already a favorable funding source for folks who are doing clean water, safe drinking water infrastructure projects. You can pay exactly the same amount back in principal and debt service and do something good in the process. So you either owe the government the $15 million that it's going to take to service the debt and pay the principal back and buy a watershed, or you can just do your project and not buy the watershed. And so it's so pain free for borrowers. And it's such a win win that actually it, it basically is the SRF program and EPA uh, through its capitalization subsidizing good conservation work that happens in the state. It's 100% paid for basically by, by those SRF funds. So um, that maybe is an archetypal uh, a point that I would make regarding your bigger question, Lee, because there, there's money that's easy and there's money that's hard, right? Uh, if there's an extra $1.45 billion that Build Back Better puts into Forest Legacy, Katie, bar the door, go do more Forest Legacy projects because they're going to be inundated with the, the, the forest legacy folks, the folks at state and private at the Forest Service are going to be anxious, hungry, eager, desperate to have your proposals in front of them. Um, and so a lot of it has to do with where the money is, not to be overly woolly Sutton about it, but if there are huge slugs that are going to have more trouble getting out the door, then it's likely that the motivation of uh, funding decision makers is going to be that much greater to put the money out there. But I don't think you can look away from the very technical reasons for these funds. Every one of these funding sources has a set of not just eligible uses, but of desired outcomes. And if you can close in, I think about that Banning Ranch project in California. Fish and Wildlife Service didn't know about it. This was a gift to them because they have money sitting in the bank and it takes care of gnat catchers and vireos and, and San Diego fairy shrimp. So they love to spend, they want to spend the money on it, but it's because the, the manifold benefits of the project include something that is core mission for the folks who are making those funding decisions. So that Venn diagram between, I got money that I don't know what to do with and the project that you're bringing me actually fits really well. Um, that's, I think that's the, the, greatest pathway to success. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, say that the, the Venn diagram you're talking about sounds like two overlapping circles at that point. Um, and then maybe taking the, the advice of Wade, I think one, one thing that we've been using about on our end 
with the amount of potential funding influx to these programs, um, there may be some intelligence not in waiting for the RFP, not in waiting for the outcome, but actually touching base with those offices that you have the most relevance, that you offer the most impact for, and helping them actually strategize about the potential ramp up. I know we've already touched base with a couple offices that say things to us like, yeah, this is, if, if these funds come through, this is more money than we know how to execute on. And we need help being strategic with meeting our mission with also meeting the spending mandate over the five or 10 year time horizon that they need to expend the funds. So um, Wade, you may have, you're nodding. So I assume you, you might oh, have- Oh, I have some. three examples of what you're describing for right now. And what Alan um, so talked about too, so. I'll, I'll push to you, Wade. And then I imagine uh, Alan will be um, sitting on his hands uh, waiting for a chance to, to uh, layer in a perspective as well. I, I will do my best to be brief, at least for me. Uh, so I'm gonna give some examples of programs that we didn't, I didn't talk about as much. You know, the first is gonna be just uh, NRCS uh, ASAP or Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. You go back about 10, 11 years ago, the Gunnison sage grouse in Colorado, it was, it was pretty much candidate for you know, endangered species listing. It was looked like writing on the wall, it's gonna get listed. And there was a big push from the conservation community in Colorado, CPW and, uh, and NRCS you know, by extension to look at, could we do enough voluntary conservation and habitat restoration that maybe we don't need to list the species at all. And by putting together something that fit well in the Fish and Wildlife Service, NRCS, you know, every state and federal agency around, yes, you wanna protect threatened species, but you don't wanna see them listed. And here's a voluntary way to do it where you're not gonna have to spend as much money on habitat. What that resulted in is we were able to consistently tap as a state for over 10 years, a lot of agri ASAP funding from NRCS um, and match it with CPW or GOCO because it fits so well into everybody's mission around ag conservation, tying water. Oh, and we can avoid listing a species. And it, and it was just so much more positive because rather than having the usual command and control approach you can get with endangered species of uh, the red cacated woodpeckers listed. So if you got cavity trees, you can't do anything. Rather than forcing things on people, it was, we're gonna pay you to voluntarily do the right thing. And it was a huge success. That's a good example of how, but it was a success because we kept talking to landowners saying, look, we'd, we'd like to move forward now, but we might need to wait six months or a year or two years or three years until it's the right time for you. But in the meantime, we're getting them excited. We're getting funders excited and we're just waiting our time until a specific project either fit within a grant round or fit with a series of projects. And it was that approach that groups like TPL, the Conservation Fund, Nature Conservancy, and some statewide land trusts like Colorado Cattlemen's Ag Land Trust and Colorado Open Lands really effectively eliminated the need to list the Gunnison sage grouse. But it worked because we brought in all those priorities. Um, another example would be the NRCS um, RCPP program or the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Uh, I do a lot of partners partnering with Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust on ranch conservation, where you've got ranches who are, their land and water is so expensive, they could not consider donating an easement. So they bring us in because we can raise the money and manage the deal that, that otherwise the, the ranchers, they're gonna have to sell for development. It, you know, donating an easement would be cost prohibitive. So we were looking at how could we scale that up on the Eastern Plains and cattlemen's had been trying for years to put together an RCPP grant on their own, couldn't quite get it there. And as luck should have it, I had a strong relationship with the ranching family that had just bought 14,000 acres that they needed to do an easement to pay for it. So we worked together and by having multiple projects, some of which I was leading on, some cattlemen's was leading on, some the Nature Conservancy was leading on. We were able to put together a coalition that got us that big pot of our CPP money. We weren't all attached at the hip. We all had our own projects, but it was by saying rather than having us go work as individuals to get our money, but work collectively to get a big pot we could all work on. That's what worked with NRCS, with GOCO. And it also I ended up bringing in some money from Excel Energy because 
they saw some benefits uh, to, to working with us around utility easements and things like that. And then the final example, which I think is more relevant for the world we're in today, uh, I, it's a, I'm kicking off kind of a new focus in, a, in Colorado, and it's kind of a donut hole of about 45,000 acres of private land that's surrounded by Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park, Kerr Conti National Recreation Area, and a lot of uh, national forest land. And the idea there is trying to kick off a partnership with the Forest Legacy Program to do a series of conservation easements over the next five to 10 years to conserve all the working forests in that area in a manner that's consistent with the Gunnison National Forest so we can mitigate for fire and ideally reduce wildfire risk there. So then now you have consistent management regimes, rec uh, public recreation, fire, and so on. So the limited resources we have in Colorado for fire can be deployed where you can't mitigate. You can't do anything to clean it up. And we'll see. I'll let you know how that goes because we're, we're waiting to see if, uh, if we get federal funding uh, from Forest Legacy or not in February. But it's another example of with these newer programs where the Biden administration is pumping a ton of money into Forest Legacy or NRCS or some of these other programs, it, it's all, it, it, and it, it is a steep learning curve to learn how to apply for and use these resources once you've learned it. You want to keep doing it. You don't want to do it one and done. So I, I would really look to any area where you want to, you think you've got a good project. See if you can cultivate a series of them. Because the more you can show that your one deal will snowball into five, the more people will want to roll with you. Alan, you're up. You know, the, I know that we're running at short of time. So maybe the only thing I'll add, and I have one example of this to offer, is that it's useful in thinking about these relationship-based, strategy-centered uh, 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 expansions of programs or creations of programs, it's good to think about the national leadership, the regional, the, the installation or unit, management unit, uh, all as independent decision makers who are part of that process. I think about the creation of the REPI program back well, 20 years ago when uh, Bob Barnes at the Nature Conservancy and I and a couple other people had look to get a couple of million dollars and the most of the folks in the defense uh, agencies had no idea whether or why they want to spend that money but there was somebody in headquarters who was a visionary it was Bruce Beard who's now at Texas A&M and who is I think a very active member of the conservation finance network but prior to his service in the office of secretary of defense Bruce was at OMB and at the department of interior working on natural resource issues so he had fire in the belly and there was an iterative process between him and the NGOs who were working on projects and the folks at the installations that recognized that this was going to be a going concern. And so I think what you need is a sponsor somewhere. You need an activist interest to deal you further in at some level. And the bottom line is that these folks talk to each other up and down the chain. So it may not be that you're working with the one who's going to make the big decision, but you've got to figure out your way in and have that close relationship that way to talk about. Thanks, Alan. And I've uh, done a terrible job at fielding uh, questions from the audience so far, but perhaps we can sneak just a few in rapid fire. So Allison, one for you. How would SRF applicants qualify for loan subsidization? So, um... It varies by state. So additional subsidization, um, the actual wording is it's for um, if the community is disadvantaged or if the project is stormwater mitigation, energy and water efficiency and sustainable project planning, design and construction. So the definitions for that are, I mean, there's no definitions for sustainable project planning and whatnot, but each state um, takes their pot of ad sub and splits it up so you have you have to come in first to know how much you can get of that um it might be on there it's probably on their application um, but the best thing to do is to talk to someone first because they will have um they'll help you get through the process and probably have a lot of pointers for how to get your project through um with and probably pick up on little um things that will make them um, more priority for the state that you could market yourself better with. So. Thanks, Allison. Alan, quick one for you. Any idea if Noah's bringing back uh, 
CELCP, which I understand to be a Great Lakes Basin program? It is not Great Lakes. That is the GLRI. Uh, KELP is L L Great Lakes states are eligible, but so are all coastal states. It's the Coastal Estuarine Land Conservation Program that was started by Fritz Hollings and Judd Gregg, South Carolina and New Hampshire in the early 2000s because they wanted to get money for their coasts and there was no other way to do it. It became a real programmatic uh, initiative in coastal states. And then it pretty much disappeared because of the lack of interest during the Bush 43 administration. It is back with a fury because there is money right now. And the money is available for uh, two things. It's, in, it's money that's included in the IIJA. It's about 200, it's 274, $278 million. It's available for NERS, for National Estuarine Reserves, or for kelp projects. And NOAA is right now undertaking the guidance as to how they're gonna divvy the money up or how they're going to make good on that. But the legislation, the, the, the infrastructure legislation is quite explicit that kelp is, is one of the two allowable uses of that money. So yes, it, it's back and it's, it's back with a vengeance. Thanks, Alan. And um, we're gonna try and sneak in one more real quick. Um, all these sources anticipated, who are the likely landowners who are going to be eligible to own this newly conserved land and their capacity to own, how do we build their capacity to own and manage these properties? Uh, looks like we might've lost Wade for a second, but um, Allison, Allen, I could also conjecture. So it depends on the project. For some of our projects, the state becomes the landowner and work, like I said, the, um, the Delaware project, they're working with their local national estuary program. It's like they do a lot of restoration work there to actually manage the project. And then the Soil Conservation District, another partner, will um, be the holder of the easement. So this so might be one of those fancy answers. It depends. <laughs> yep, it depends. And like Wade and Alan are, um, have been saying, like the partnerships are really important. So you just kind of kind of find people to fit in the puzzle and make it all happen. Well, I'm thinking about the back half of that question about how those folks are going to be equipped to to make management yeah. decisions and actually spend the money that's necessary to do the management. And it and yes, it depends. But I think there's an obligation on the part of all folks who are in, involved in these programs to take a look at those ultimate stewards and make sure that they've got the capacity to manage. And in some cases, the ultimate landowners are, you know, if you're doing a RCCP easement project or an ALA easement project, the ultimate landowner is the landowner. And like I and TPL have been involved in a, in a project in Arizona where a very conservation spirited landowner is taking all the money that he gets out of a, 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 on, a on an easement that's ultimately gonna be about 18,000 acres of amazing sky island habitat as it's known. He's plowing it all back into his own conservation efforts. And so you've got people like that who say, Okay, we don't need to worry about him, but what about other folks who are working and may not have the capacity to put together and implement the conservation plan that's required under some of these ag programs? And so I think it's the same is true of public landowners of federal agencies. Yeah, they're gonna buy more land. Are they gonna have the capacity to manage it? Is the uh, National Parks and Public Land uh, uh, Infrastructure account that was established under the Great American Outdoors Act is that going to be enough to take care of their needs? And if it isn't, I think those of us who advocate are going to need to be back at the well, talking to appropriators or other money decision makers, talking to agencies about providing the money that's necessary for that ongoing stewardship. Yeah, being realistic about stewardship costs and management needs for sure. Well, uh, to each one of you, thank you for being here today. This has just been a phenomenally useful panel. I hope the audience has gotten a little bit of uh, motivation to go turn over some new rocks, place some phone calls, and think a bit more expansively about how the secret sauce recipe can apply to their work and how to anticipate some of the funding and financing sources that are coming down the pipeline, reinvigorating some of those programs we know and love, and perhaps even capitalizing a few new ones we haven't used yet. Um, the next session, so I'll segue in, we're going to be back in action for our part three of the learning lab on February 8th, and that is borrowing money to save the world, 
a, a very unambitious title for that session, um, but we figure we have done plenty of sessions in the past about the nuts and bolts of how you actually borrow money for land conservation, but we've learned that people don't often really take action until they're in a total crunch and a total bind. So uh, for February 8th, we also want to build in a little bit more about the spirituality of borrowing money, if you will, and why you ought to be talking to your board about it sooner. Um, so stay tuned, come back for more, and we hope that you will join us again on February 8th. Thank you again for joining us for today, especially to our panelists, and also especially to the Highstead and Conservation Finance Network colleagues behind the scenes who are making this possible. Uh, have a wonderful Tuesday afternoon, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you.